Hey YouTube and welcome back to my show. My name's Phil. Thank you all so much for stopping by. Please like and subscribe to my channel. That'd be absolutely amazing. We're here today to talk about how brilliant Fight Camp's been, how brilliant it's been for boxing and sport in general. I think Matchroom and Eddie Hearn, what you've done for the sport during this pandemic truly is amazing. So a big, big congratulations to you guys. It truly is, you know, the whole of the production of Fight Camp. The whole series was just sublime. You know, 50-50 fights, I believe, has brought women's boxing onto the next level and not forgetting the big crescendo, which was Dylan White, Povetkin, which I think really lived up for fight fans. Wasn't the result that we all wanted. We wanted Dylan to, you know, do the business, but, you know, it wasn't to be, but I think he will get it on the rematch. But nevertheless, it was one epic encounter, all with no audience, spectators, and it was still going on. It was truly wonderful. I think what Eddie Hearn has done is so, so clever because it's worked. It's had everyone talking. People have come up to me who are not even, you know, into boxing going, oh, did you watch that fight camp? It was brilliant. I would like to see now, you know, during this pandemic, where else could it go? I believe it can go anywhere it wants to go. I would like to see a bit of Contender. Now, if you've watched Contender, you would have seen it when it was on in America. It was like really successful. I believe they could kind of create a fight camp contender, maybe versus Frank Warren Stable. I think it's got the hallmarks of being spectacular, and I think Eddie Hearn deserves once again a big, big round of applause. You know, your great fights, you know, Shannon Courtney, that fight was amazing. I know she'd never won, but getting knocked down, getting back up to know, you know, to really give it a go, and I thought she just edged it. Sam Eggleton versus uh, Ted Cheeseman, brilliant fight. And then obviously, you know, not even, you know, we're not forgetting Katie Taylor. Katie Taylor's fight was a tough, tough fight. I think she just edged it very slightly, but it was brilliant. The commentators, but but the big question is now, where does Fight Camp go? Eddie Hearn, where are you going to take Fight Camp? I believe that Eddie Hearn's going to take it now to the next level. You know, look at the whole series of it and think, where can we improve on? I think it's going to be hard to improve on that, but I definitely think Eddie Hearn is the man to do so. And I think something like Contender, you know, when he had Price Fighter, that kind of vibe, maybe bringing in boxers who fight on the road, you know, some people may know him as journeymen, but getting the journeymen involved and, you know, putting some big prize money up, would be brilliant. I think Eddie Hearn is really doing well in boxing at the moment, and I think it's only going to get better with his vision and drive. The whole of the boxers, I believe, uh, really well. You know, the production of it backstage, the, the commentary was brilliant, and above all, I'm a big, big fan. So Eddie Hearn, keep up fight camp. This is a, a short and sweet video, but uh, I'm a big fan. I, I believe. I believe that you know you've got to sit down with um, Frank Warren because if you guys can get together and hash out a plan to do a kind of fight camp where you're both working on both networks with BT and Sky and doing a kind of contender esque kind of you know vibe, you know you can imagine the big crescendo of their top boys fighting, top women fighting as well would just be absolutely brilliant. I'm on board. I think it works. I can't wait to see more of fight camp. I can't wait to see more of Frank Warren what what he's going to do. I think. As a whole, during this pandemic, boxing is in a... Amigos and welcome to my brand new show here on YouTube, Phil's Sport Talk. My name's Phil, thank you all so much for tuning in. Please like, subscribe and share, that would be absolutely amazing. I'm here today to talk about sport and talk about the legend that is Mike Tyson. Now I don't know if you know this, but Mike Tyson in the boxing world is still a massive deal. In my opinion, he's one of the most iconic boxers in the last 30 to 40 years. He, he's amazing. Um, and there's been a lot of talk of late, Mike's going to make a comeback. <laughs> now, if you talk to a lot of hardcore boxing fans in the kind of boxing world, you would be met with, you know, kind of, well, you know, I don't think it's right for him to make a comeback. And I 
do agree with that. I'm not going to kind of say, yeah, I think he should make a comeback. I do agree with a lot of the hardcore boxing fans. And, you know, I would like to think that I'm a hardcore boxing fan to some degree. I love combat sport. Would I think it's right for him to make a comeback? I, I just want to stress this now. No, I don't. When I first saw him back in the gym looking absolutely jacked and healthy, I was just so happy because he kind of looked healthy. He had this positive kind of vibe about him. And I thought that can only be a good thing. Obviously, when you see a 54-year-old with speed and power still like that on the mitts, it's going to get people talking, especially when at the end of the video he goes, I'm back. I'm back. You kind of go, holy, you know, is he coming back? Like, what's going on here? Now, when he said that, you, you would have got loads of promoters kind of going, hang on a minute, this, this could work. But a lot of promoters hopefully are thinking it would work in the right way. Now, do I think he should make a professional comeback? In my opinion, no. You know, would, is it potentially, could he get a license? Yes, I think there's certain states in America that, that would give him a license. But it would be detrimental to him, detrimental to boxing, and it wouldn't be good for his health. Because if, even if he was to get in there uh, with one of the guys in the top 20, I just don't know what that would achieve. You know, 54-year-old, I think it looks bad for boxing. So I'm not in with it. But I am in when you talk about Mike Tyson of Vander Holyfield in an exhibition fight. Six to eight rounds, 12-ounce gloves. Does it sell? I'm, you know what, my hairs are standing up even thinking about it. It does sell. It's amazing. It's even making... I'm so hyped for it because I think you put that on a bill, nostalgia, you're going to get so many people who are sports fans, not just boxing fans. You get sports fans, com combat fans, MMA fans, but obviously boxing fans, wrestling fans, you know, people who are just intrigued by Mike Tyson would tune in. So you can imagine the pay-per-view buyers would be... would go through the roof. But it would have to be done in the right way, guys. It has to be done in the right way. Mike Tyson couldn't go in the ring. You know, let me pick, pick every way out. He couldn't get in the ring with someone like Dylan White. I mean, it, it just wouldn't work. It just wouldn't happen. And I know Dylan White would be like, I'm not getting in the ring with Mike Tyson. There's far too much respect. It, so it wouldn't sell. Would there be a heavyweight that if he did get his license back, could would it work? I'm sure there would be a heavyweight that would fight him and I'm sure that it would be staged. But I just don't think a lot of people who care about him and care about the sport would really tune in. But when you start talking about him fighting against the Van der Holyfield, and let's not forget they both had them two iconic fights where you know the second fight, Van der Holyfield got his ear chewed off. Would Van der Holyfield be up for it? I know I've seen him do some videos. And again, he looks in fantastic shape. So what would their exhibition be like? I think it would be a tear-up. I think they would go in there and try to take each other's heads off, but it would be done safe. They'd have, you know, the 12 ounce gloves. I think it would most probably be two minutes around and it would most probably be six rounds or maybe eight rounds. And I think, you know, there would, it would just be done right. Now, could this be put on a show? Absolutely. Would it sell? Yes. Would would the gates, would there be big gates? Would it sell out? Yeah. I, maybe this is me getting a bit carried away. I think it would sell out Wembley. I, I do. I think it would sell out if it had the right card. You know, you're talking about Anthony Joshua potentially next year fighting Tyson Fury. For for me, that's a ama an amazing fight. No, no matter what that that sells, could this exhibition be on that bill? I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go against the grain here and say, yeah, it could. I think it could be, and I think it would work. And I think Eddie Hearn would be the man to make that work. The the, the zone would. You you can you can see him now in the boardroom getting excited. I, I'm like thinking there, wow, what what would it be like? Sky, you know, Sky would be pumped for it. But you know, Sky are all about integrity. So I'm you know I'm sure that Adam Smith and the rest of Sky would be like, yeah, we we welcome that fight. But it's got to be done right. It's got to be done in an exhibition. Who would Tyson fight? Now I keep talking about him getting back in the ring with Evander Holyfield. That that is the obvious choice. Um, and there's Shannon Briggs who's kind of thrown his name in the hat and said, yeah, look, I'd be up for it. Would they earn money from it? I think they would. I think some money would go to charity, and I think there would be happy parties. Now, when you talk about them having an exhibition, it works. I've only just touched the surface here, 
but there would be so many ideas. The production of it, you, you can imagine Eddie Earn getting the production, Mike Tyson walking into the ring with them black trunks and then black boxing boots with no music. That kind of dark atmosphere when he comes in, being menaced, you know, that kind of menaced look that he has when he's in the ring. Would he still bring that to an exhibition fight with Van der Holyfield? I think so, and I think it would work. But that's it, just an exhibition. Now, they're my thoughts on Phil's Talk Sport. Guys, I've got to say thank you all so much. I've been so nervous about doing this first show. I really have. But it's been amazing. And I've you know, I've really enjoyed it. And I'm going to be doing loads more content in the coming weeks about MMA, boxing. I'm going to have some football content in there as well. We're going to be doing other stuff. Uh, and it's really exciting for me. So thank you. I know I said thank you when I first started this video, but thank you all so much for kind of tuning in, supporting me, sending me some like positive vibes. I've had a lot of people ask me uh, where I get a lot of my clothes from and um, it's Roots of Fight. So if I'm gonna leave all like their um, information in the um, information in the description below. Look at me, I don't even know what I'm talking about here. You can tell it's my first video. And obviously my brand here, Oh yes, we do like these tops. They're going to be coming live very soon and I'm going to be um, sending a few out when I get the stock in that I, uh, I'm happy with. So do stay tuned for that. But all my other clothes are from Roots of Fights and I'll put all the information in uh, the link below. But thank you all so much for tuning in, guys. You've been amazing. Uh, my name's Phil and uh, I'll see you all soon, amigos. Cheers. <laughs>
an absolute gentleman. Thank you, Enzo. I know I've said thank you many times, but thank you so much. You know, you look at boxers and true, you know, pros that do a lot for the community, and Enzo Macronelli is definitely one of them. Um, I know he's got his uh, CBD company, Supreme CBDs, which is him and Anthony Fowler's. I think it's Anthony Fowler's company and Enzo's, I'm not sure, the, the one ends of it. But I know that they promote it lots and I know it's doing a lot of great for a lot of people out there. So I will put all their information in this description below. I can't wait to try the products myself. But Enzo, thank you for everything you've done for British Boxing. As a fan, you know, as someone who knows you now, you've always been really courteous and kind to me. And you talk loads about mental health and bringing it, you know, you bring it up for people to kind of listen and, and it does help people that you know the way you're so open and honest and that can only be a good thing for humanity and boxing itself you're you're an absolute gentleman mate and i just wanted to do this video today to say thank you to you show my name's Phil thank you all so much for stopping by we're here today to talk about the weekend's football results in the Premier League and uh, what a weekend it was for football let's start with Chelsea and West Brom 3-3 West Brom going 3 new up now I, I said to my wife I said look I'm not going to watch football let's have a day with you me and Logan and then you know not watch football and I'm glad I did that but every now and then I sporadically kind of check the results on my phone on my Sky Sports app I see West Brom go up after, what was it, the third or fourth minute. I was like, okay. I then check back again and West Brom are 3-0 up. I was like, what is going on here? And then I thought, I'm not checking again. I look at full time and it's 3-3. I was like, what have I missed? I was like, I can't wait for match of the day. I watched match of the day and I was like, were West Brom really good or were Chelsea really bad? I think it was a bit of both. I think Chelsea's defence really let Chelsea down. You know, they're gelling together. It's a new team. Alonso made some schoolboy errors out there. Now, Alonso's been a great servant for Chelsea, so I don't want to come down on him, but there was a lot of mistakes. Thiago Silva made that mistake. I think he's starting to realise that on the in the Premier League, you just don't get very long on the ball. But we've got to, excuse <coughs> me, we've got to give Thiago Silva some time. It was his first game. He was captain. Yeah, he did that mistake, but we know the class that he can give and what he's going to give to Chelsea. They're going to make mistakes. You know, there's not one player on that football Chelsea uh, pitch Saturday that didn't make a mistake of some kind. I know Thiago Silva's mistake cost us a goal, but we've got to stick with him. I think overall, watching the game in the first half, I, I just couldn't believe what I saw in the match of the day. But let's talk about the second half and the goals. I think Mason Mount's goal was outstanding. Tammy Abraham is growing in confidence. hudson Adoy coming on. I think Lampard did some amazing tactical subs. But I do think Giroud should start. I think when Giroud comes on, when he's on that pitch, things happen for Chelsea. Regardless if he scores or if he doesn't, his positional play, the way he gets in positions, the way he terrorises defenders. I really hope in the coming weeks, I know Chelsea have got Tottenham in the Cup and then Crystal Palace. For me, I hope Giroud starts. I think he brings so much to the Chelsea football team. Don't get me wrong, I think Chelsea's new signings are amazing. You know, Timo Werner, I think, is going to be a great player, but it's going to take time. I think Kyle's going to take time. He's not just going to come into midfield and, you know, everyone's going to be like, Havertz, he's the new Hazard. He, you know, he's, it's going to take time. I remember it taking Eden Hazard a lot, you know, a long time to kind of fit into Chelsea play. But once he did, he became one of our greatest midfielders, possibly the best midfielder Chelsea have ever had. Now, I think with Chelsea, you've got a lot of players coming back. You've got Ziyech, Pulisic, um, Cheerwell. They're all coming back. So I think that's going to change the dynamics of Chelsea. Let's talk about Mendy, the new goalkeeper they're signing. I think he's going to be one of the most underrated signings out of the whole season, out of the whole Premier League. I think he's going to do wonders at Chelsea in goal. Where does this leave Kepa? Would Chelsea get that 70 million back on him? I don't think they would. I'd be surprised if they got 10 million back on Kepa. Now, I think Chelsea 
I'm not going to sell Kepa and still try to get the best out of him because they're never going to recuperate all that money for him. Would they put him out on loan? Maybe. Would it do him the world of good? I think it would. Or will you see the best out of him now whilst you see him fight for his place? I don't know, but I think it's exciting times for Chelsea. And I still think they're going to be up there um, at the end of the season. I still think they're going to finish third or fourth. I think they're going to be there or thereabouts. Hopefully they win a cup. But I do think Lampard is the right man for Chelsea. And I think he's going to do wonderful things there. Let's talk about Man City and Leicester. No one saw that coming, did they? 5-2. I think Vardy is one of the best strikers in the Premier League. And even at 33, I still think he gives the Premier League so much. He gives Leicester so much. <coughs> and I still think he would give England so much as well. I'd love to see him back playing for England. I just don't get why he's retired. I think Southgate would have him back in the squad. He's a goal scorer. The, the way he played, the way he kind of plays off defenders, the way he kind of sneaks around defenders, his old footballing attitude for Leicester is great. I think Brendan Rodgers must be sit, sat there and going, you know what, we sell a lot of our best players. We can name loads of their best players they've sold. You know, selling Maguire to Man United. Um, they sold Kante to Chelsea. The list goes on. It, it goes on and goes on. Cheerwell to Chelsea. But they seem to kind of revive themselves. Every time they sell a player, they get a player come in who turns out to be this great player. Madison, phenomenal player. And I'm glad that he signed this new contract with Leicester because I think you're going to see him get better and better and better. And I think Leicester are going to be better than what they were last season. Now, last season they finished fifth. Where could they finish this season? They're going to be top half of the table. I, I, you know, could they finish third? Maybe. You know, Crystal Palace, although they lost to Everton, they still look good. Now, Everton, for me, are going to be the team of the season for me. I think they're going to be right up there. Ancelotti's got them playing amazing football. It wouldn't surprise me if you see them in fifth, maybe sixth position. I said they're going to take over from where Wolves did last season. Arsenal, I think, are going to be the, the, the secret team in disguise this year. Arteta, for me, is one of the best managers out there and he's going to get Arsenal playing football that he wants them to play, that he wants the fans to see. He's going to bring in some more signings, I believe, but they're the ones to watch this year. Man United... Um, you know, that they, they beat Brighton and and in spells, I thought they looked good. Are they going to be up there at the end of the season? I just don't know. I don't know. I think they need to grow in confidence. I think they were lacking confidence against Man United, uh, against Brighton. But I do think you need to give them time. It's a new team. Is Solskjaer the man to lead them to the next phase? I don't know. But I think they'll give him a chance. And I hope they do because Solskjaer's a great man. But... Overall, I think the Premier League is going to be good this season. It's a shame that supporters can't be in attendance at the moment. And I think financially it's going to be a strain. But hopefully the Premier League can dig deep and help the lower leagues out. Because that's where I think the problem is really going to be the gates there. Because the lower league, you know, rely on big gates. So I just hope we get through this COVID. And I hope the Premier League, there's a lot of talk that the Premier League are going to help the lower leagues out financially. And I hope that's true. Overall, I'm really excited about the Premier League. Let me know your thoughts, guys. I'd love to know the teams you support. I'd love to know what you think, who's going to finish where, what signings you would like to see at clubs. But overall, it's really, really exciting. Um, someone asked me, do, you, do I think that Chelsea, before the transfer window, are going to get Declan Rice? I don't know. I, I, I don't know if they're going to get that signing. I think they may go in for him. Where's he going to play at Chelsea? Where will he play? This is exciting times. All these signings, all clubs talking about players they may go for, who they may sell. I know Chelsea may sell a few players, but overall football is in a great bit of health at the moment. I know there's a lot going on in our country with COVID, but overall I think it's exciting times. And once the crowds can get back in the Premier League, I think it's going to be brilliant. Oh, and just before I go, I've not spoken about Tottenham or Newcastle. That handball was a disgrace. Sorry. I, I think these new the new rulings, the, you know, the new I, I just I, I just don't like it. You know, that was never handball. That was never intentional. And I think they 
it took three points away from Tottenham. And you can see why Jose was frustrated. The whole of Tottenham and I bet a lot of their supporters are frustrated. But I'd love to hear from Tottenham fans to what they think about that verdict. I, I was disgusted with it. It should have never have been a penalty. And I would like to see in the coming weeks what actually happens. Because I don't think the Premier League teams and a lot of you know commentators are going to lie down. I think they're going to say their opinions. And stuff needs to happen. Because this can't keep happening week in, week out. Just decisions like this, it's going to ruin the game. But anyway, thank you all so much for stopping by. I love talking about football, guys. You can see that I get really, really excited. My name's been Phil. Thank you all so much for tuning in. We'll see you very soon. Cheers, YouTube. That was super smooth, wasn't it? Hey YouTube, how are we doing? And welcome back to my show. My name's Phil. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Um, guys, I'm so sorry I've not been about doing any content. I've been really busy with work. But now we're in the good old dreaded lockdown. I'm going to try and do some content at least every other day. So we'll be talking all things football, all things boxing, <coughs> excuse me, all things sport. So we're going to be doing lots and lots of stuff. Um, I'm here today though to talk about Chelsea and Man United and maybe our Tottenham title contenders. Who knows? We'll wait and see. Let's start off with Chelsea. Guys, I watched Chelsea yesterday and I thought they looked amazing. This new system Frank's got on plan, the 4-3-3, is it back going back to when Conte was manager? Can Chelsea kind of progress and win the league with this formation as they did in the first season as Antonio Conte. It's exciting times, guys. Yesterday, I thought Chelsea looked really good. I thought they played brilliant. Thiago Silva is 36, guys. He is 36 and he looks amazing. I think you potentially could get another two to three years out of him as long as he stays injury-free and Frank rests him when you know he needs that rest to kind of recover. I'm impressed, guys. They're back four now, really starting to gel and look good. Mendy in goal. Possibly, for me, Mendy and Thiago Silva are the signings of the season for me. I think they look great. Thiago Silva is so assured at the back and Mendy in goal. I just can't see Kepa getting back that number one spot. I can't. I think Mendy looks good. He controls that box well. And the great thing is, um, obviously, he's learning English as, as we speak. But, you know, he speaks French. Thiago Silva obviously speaks French. So does Zuma. So they've got that kind of camaraderie and that kind of knowledge of each other. Um, we've got Cheerwheel, Rhys James at the back. I think Chelsea look amazing. And I, I definitely think top three. Will they do well in the Champions League? Who knows? I hope so. So I'm a bit of a Chelsea fanboy. Um, and hopefully they do well in the FA Cup. I definitely think they could finish top three, top four. 100%. I would just like to see, I know I say this all the time, and yes, guys, I know I look like a farmer today. I've gone for this farmer look. It's locked down. I don't care. I thought, let's try something a bit different. Anyway, um, Giroud, please, Frank, can you play Giroud? We need Giroud up front. Now, I know Timo scoring and penalties, which is going to, of course, give him confidence, and Abraham looks to be firing again. I think we need Giroud just for a few games, you know, please start Giroud. I know I'm a big, big fan of Giroud, but when he came on last night, you know, one of his first proper touches, he almost scored. Um, the week before that, when he came on, he had that offside goal, so he's still got that goal-scoring instinct. And, you know, he's just turned 34, so I'd love to see him play more, Frank. But um, as a whole, I think Chelsea are in a really, really healthy place. Now, it seems to me as though they're all playing and gelling as a team. I still think Kovacic should be in there. I don't know why, for me personally, Jorginho is in there instead of Kovacic. Um, when you've got Kante in there and Jorginho, I just don't get that how they play well together. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong, I don't know, but Kovacic last season was a player of the season. And for me, as as a fan of football, I looked at him and thought he was one of the best players in the Premiership. 100% one of the best players. So Frank, please get Kovacic. Is he injured? I don't know. Tell me, guys. What's happening also with hudson Adoy? Is he playing? Um, because I think he needs to get in there. But, you know, let, let's talk about... Um, Mason Mount. Mason Mount is playing really well. I think Mason Mount sometimes gets a lot of bad press. But every time I see Mason play, I think he's amazing. He's starting to put on a bit of weight and muscle now as well. Um, and I'm going to say this now, guys, and I'm going to get a lot of flack for saying this. 
But he reminds me a bit of Beckham, the way he plays football. He does. He, there's some Beckham elements there. He's still young. Let's give him a few more seasons. I I always feel happy when I see Mason starting um, in the Chelsea eleven. He's a good player, guys, and I think we need to stick with him. I think Chelsea need to stick with Mason, and I think Lampard definitely sees a lot of talent there with him, and the proofs in the pudding. And I believe also that he will start for England soon as a first team regular, one hundred percent. The Man United. I just watched that game and their back four were like a Sunday league team. It was like watching a Sunday league team on the acting marshes. I think Rio Ferdinand said that and I couldn't agree more. They were just terrible. They they looked awful. They had no vision. They had no there was no drive in the team. There was no leaders. For for me, when I watched Manchester United, a great club, the best club in, in you know Britain, one of the best clubs in the world. They, there was no drive there. There was no one on that pitch. There was no Roy Kings. There was no David Beckhams or Gary Neville's. The list goes on. That oh, Them old boys. Now, I know you have to move on, and there's only so long you can talk about the David Beckhams, the Roy Kings, you know, the Van Nistroys, the Gary Neville's. I, you know, I'm missing out loads of other great players. Skulls. The list goes on. We do need to move on from that era. But the reason why people keep referring back to then, because United then were natural-born winners. They were classed, they had everything. This United team, I just think, lack any kind of drive to win the game. You know, there's no passion there. There's no leaders on the pitch getting hold of them. You know, I mean, Rashford, <coughs> excuse me, Rashford's amazing. What he's doing outside of football is truly inspiring. It really is. And, you know, for, for someone to be doing what he's doing... Is beautiful, and I'm a big, big Rashford fan. And this, this is not a rant on Rashford's football, but we need, we need him to be banging in goals non-stop. We need, and now I don't know if it's Rashford playing bad, because I think Rashford's a great player, but it just seems to me as though no one's playing for each other out there. They just look poor. Man United's defence, I, I just have no words for their defence. I think their defence may, may be lacking in confidence, maybe. But I can't see him finishing top four. And I may have mentioned that in one of my previous videos that United potentially could finish top four. But I just can't see it. I cannot see United being in top four. I'd be surprised if they get top six. Is Oli the right man for United? Have they given him enough chances? I, t I think Oli Solskjaer is... Oli Gunnar Solskjaer is a legend at Man United. That what a, what a footballer he was there. He was, you know, he was this like super sub that would come on and score loads of goals. Is he a manager? I don't think he is. There, I've said it, and I think Maurizio is there in the background waiting to take that job. And I think if Maurizio gets the job as Man United manager, maybe next season, maybe United will stick with Solskjaer. I don't know where he could go. I think you'll see a different United. United have got some fantastic players. They really have, like Rashford, a big fan of Rashford. He's a great player. But I just don't know what's going on in that changing room. I don't know what's going on with that management. I think they need a new kind of team in there. I know there's a lot of problems going on in the back room, but United are in trouble at the minute. Maguire completely lost his confidence, but he is a class player. Luke Shaw, for me, just looks like he's out of breath straight away. You know, the whistle goes. Luke Shaw looks like he's out of breath for me. You know, he's improved. Of course, he has, but they. Um, they really need to get their their stuff together, United, you know, because at the minute, I just believe that they're, I'd be surprised if they finish top six. And uh, this pains me to say what I'm about to say now, but I think Tottenham potentially could be title contenders as Mourinho got his mojo back. I think he has. Keane and Son up front. Gareth Bale now slowly getting back to the player he was, getting that fitness back. You know, we've seen what Gareth Bale did in the Premiership. We've seen what he did at Real Madrid. Um, I think Tottenham potentially a title contenders. Mourinho now he's just sat back down. Well, you know, I knew this all along. I hadn't lost my mojo. Let's not forget what Mourinho's done at previous clubs. Let's not forget what he did at Chelsea, Inter Milan, Real Madrid. Even... Manchester United, a lot of people kind of discredit him for what he did there, but he won the Europa League, he got him second in the league. United fans now would take that all day long. Let's not forget, you know, the United sacked Mourinho or did he leave? I can't quite remember, but he did a lot at United, he won stuff. Mourinho is a born winner, so um, 
yeah, I'm excited about Tottenham. I'm, I'm also excited, you know, let's not forget Villa. I know Villa have had a few bad results, but Villa are going to be up there. They've got a great team. And what I love about Villa more than anything, that it's a family-run club. They get it right. They've got a great back room and they've got a great kind of camaraderie. So you're going to see Villa up there. Everton have lost a few games, but that doesn't mean anything. Liverpool are not playing particularly well. You know, they've lost their best defender, but they're still top of the league. So that tells you where Liverpool are in their winning mentality. But overall, I think it's great. You know, Fulham get their first win. I'm a big fan of Scott Parker, so that's brilliant. Palace have kind of dropped off a bit, but let's not, you know, count them out. I think this Premier League is really exciting. It's just such a shame we're now back in lockdown. And I can't see any fans being back in stadiums much before, before spring. I can't, you know, I reckon it might not be till next season that we'll see supporters back in the stadium, which is really sad, you know, because not only do a lot of the grassroots clubs and the, you know, the Vauxhall Conference, the, the lower league teams, they need supporters to play the way, to pay the wages of the players to run the club. It's not just the players that get paid, guys. It's all the people that make the club tick. And, you know, supporters are missing out because it's, a great thing I, I you know what guys I remember first going to a Chelsea match with my dad and brother and uh, I still remember it vividly funny enough I remember the it's that vivid in front of us was the actor who played Adrian Mole I don't know if he's a Chelsea fan I don't know let me know but he was in the front watching Chelsea and then moments I just think people are missing that that family Saturday fun so the sooner this lockdown is over and the sooner supporters can get back in to the stadiums, the better. But um, they're my uh, weekly thoughts uh, this week, guys, on my Premiership Roundup. We're going to be doing some more in the coming days. I'm going to be doing so much more content. But thank you all so much, guys, for tuning in and stopping by. And uh, we'll see you soon. Cheers, guys. smooth there guys no one noticed anything <laughs> my name is phil guys welcome back to my channel thank you all so much for tuning in i really do appreciate it. i don't know what that hand movement was there but thank you all so much guys as i said in my previous content i'm so sorry that i've not really done content for about two or three weeks i think it's two weeks I've been so busy with work, but now we're in lockdown. I'm going to be doing so much more. We're going to be talking all things football and all things boxing, MMA, and, of course, other sports as well. And today uh, I'm here to talk about Derek Chisora fighting Usyk. I enjoyed that fight, guys. I've got to be honest. I thought it was a great fight. I thought Derek fought brilliantly. I think it was a close fight, to be honest. And um, But I did have Usyk winning, but I thought Derek fought great. I thought this new kind of shape and this new aura around it which is thanks to David Hanley's team can only be a good thing and I know at 36 people are going there's some people that said should he maybe retire I don't think so I think he's most probably got another year in him another year two years uh, of, of you know big fights and I think there's big fights still out there for Derek Chisora I really do there's a fight maybe with Joseph Parker why not Tyson Fury again now I know Tyson Fury fought Chisora twice and beat him convincingly twice. The second fight, you know, he was stopped on his stall. Uh, but there, there are exciting fights. I'd like to see maybe Chisora, Yui Fury would be a good fight. Um, or maybe even throw Chisora in there with Deontay Wilder. That'd be a great fight, wouldn't it? Um, I've heard all the crazy stuff that Wilder has said, guys. And uh, I, yeah, Wilder, you don't need to say that, mate. You, you're looking silly. I don't know whose team is around him, but please, guys, stop with the silliness. He got comprehensively beat by Tyson Fury. End of. Take it like a man. Go again. You're, you're a world champion and a great fighter. But I think some of the excuses and the conspiracy theories were um, somewhat outrageous. But um, anyway, let's, let's go back to Chisora and Usyk. What a great fight. Um, do I think that uh, Usyk is a legitimate uh, heavyweight? I don't really, I, I think he's one of the best pound for pound fighters I've ever seen in my lifetime, for sure. Uh, I think he does everything so easy. He's a fighter's fighter, the way he keeps fights at range, timing, the way he moves. What I like about Usyk, when I see him on the ropes and he just 
he does that little pivot where he moves and then he's in range for that boom, that looping uppercut, and he just moves out of range again. And he, I think he really confuses fighters. He nullifies uh, their, their boxing kind of skills. He's a top fighter. I'm a huge fan. Could he do that against Anthony Joshua? I don't think he could. I think Anthony would stop him, and I think Fury would box rings around him. I, I really, I, I believe Fury's that good. I think where Fury's yeah, almost seven feet, seven feet tall, isn't he? I think he would lead on uh, Usyk. I think it he would drain him, and Tyson's boxing IQ would outsmart him. I believe. I think it would be a, a wide points decision. I think Joshua would stop him. I think Usyk would have his moments with Joshua, but I think Joshua hits far too hard, far too hard, and uh, I think it's a fight that Joshua will take and. I, I believe it's a, a fight that he would win quite convincingly for me, purely for size, more than anything, and power. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely exciting. And boxing is really exciting. I know we've not got punters in at the moment, which is, again, I've said it in my previous content, is really detrimental to the sport. But hopefully, guys, once we get out of this kind of hellish situation of COVID-19, and the lockdown we can get some supporters back in the stadiums because obviously we've got Joshua and, and a Pulev fight in December I believe I don't believe there'd be any uh, crowds there at all for that which is quite sad but the sooner we can get uh, crowd, crowds in the better um, I think Eddie Hearn is doing wonders for boxing as is Frank Warren um, I've just bought Eddie Hearn's book funny enough I'm reading it, I'm really enjoying it, quite inspiring as well, but he is doing wonders for boxing, he's making big fights, he's still trying to make it happen. I'd like to see more fight camp. The, the problem, we're not the reason why we're not seeing fight camp, because of, obviously the weather, but I'd love to see fight camp in maybe somewhere like Saudi Arabia, um, one of the islands off, you know, somewhere in uh, the Far East, would be great to stage a fight camp. I think if anyone could do it, Matt Trin could do it. I know it's very... Dana White UFC, but I know Eddie Hearn thinks a lot of Dana White and I, I know he loves the model that the UFC have got. So, yeah, it's definitely exciting and uh, I'm pumped for Daniel Dubois and Joe Joyce. Do you want me to give my prediction? Yes, you do, I hear. I think Joe Joyce might do it, guys. I've got a feeling that Joe Joyce stops him. I think Dubois was going to be on him for about maybe six rounds maybe run out of gas and Dubois is, is a fantastic fighter guys he truly is a tremendous fighter but um, I, I think Joe Joyce stops him I really do I think Joe Joyce is better than a lot of people give him credit for I know he's got that style when he just comes forward but um, let's not forget guys he should have won Olympic gold he was robbed from that so that's a fight I'm excited for if I'm honest guys that's the fight I'm most excited for coming up in uh, the not too distant future it's, it's this year isn't it I believe it's next month am I right in saying it's next month or maybe the end of this month but uh, nevertheless it's exciting times but yeah guys boxing is in a good and a healthy place thank you all so much for tuning in and uh, we'll be back in the coming days talking all things boxing see you soon amigos cheers <laughs>
Alan Babich is just a pure wrecking machine. He's like one of them old school heavyweights. He's not a big heavyweight, he's six foot one, which is still quite tall, but for a heavyweight, it's not so big. He's about 15 stone, 16 stone. So again, he's not that kind of big to be a heavyweight. You know, a lot of heavyweights are like 17, 18, 19 stone. And he just comes in and he's just like a wrecking ball machine. He's just got that old kind of, you know, style where he's out there and he's going to have a brawl like a bare knuckle boxer and he's going to keep fighting and keep punching till the boxer who he's fighting cannot take any more. Now, will that style, will that kind of pace, will he be able to continue that when he steps up his game and fights a boxer that's going to get back in that ring and punch him hard and go at the same pace? Only time will tell. But yesterday against Tom Little, he looked great, I think. And, you know, Tom Little was fit as a fiddle yesterday. He was fit. He was coming into that fight to win. It didn't work out for him. And I'm, I'm a fan of Tom Little. I've got a bit of a soft spot for him. He's a nice guy. But it wasn't meant to be for Tom Little. But let's talk about how great Alan Babich was. He was really good, guys. He'd come out. And if people want to talk about Alan Babich's boxing IQ, you would most probably go, well, he's not really a boxer. He's just a brawler. But there's a lot to his game, guys. He can punch by the looks of it. You know, I think he's had nine fights, down to eight or nine fights, all KOs. He can punch. He's got the most amazing stamina I've seen in a long time. And he can take a dig. You know, yesterday, Tom Little caught him with a few shots. And Alan Babich was just like, I'm coming back. Now, let's bear in mind, Tom Little's six foot six. And he can hit. And he was just punching Babich, the savage, sometimes. And Babich was just walking through it. And eventually got the stoppage. They're talking about, you know, potentially in the near future, him and Philip Herkovic fighting. That's a fight I wouldn't like to see just yet. I'd like to see Babich get a few more fights under his belt and then maybe go into that fight against Herkovic, which would be a great fight. But I still think, you know, the Savage, that's what his nickname is, the Savage is a cruiserweight. And I think he had caused more damage down there. But it was a great fight, nevertheless. And I think he did really well. And uh, commiserations to Tom Little, because I do like Tom, and I hope he continues, and I hope he gets a win, and then, you know, maybe gets a southern area title shot and take it from there. The other fight that I was really, really impressed with was Conor Ben, top of the bill fight. I thought Conor Ben looked amazing last night. He was in there with a guy called Familia. Am I pronouncing that right? Familia? Famella? Famella. I think it's Famella. And, um, you know, he's a good fighter. This, this German guy's been in there with Sean Porter, went the whole 12 rounds with him. He's no kind of couch potato. He knows his way around the ring. Everyone was talking about Familia's kind of great footwork. I, I didn't really see that last night, but I think it was because Conor Ben was so good. Everything about Conor Ben, his ring IQ, his educated pressure, you know, the uppercuts when he was in close, and most of all, his jab. His jab looked great. He wasn't in there as this kind of reckless brawler, you know, trying to go in there and just take his opponent's head off. He was in there, it was educated pressure, he was using the jab, using the jab, and boom, uppercut, moving around the uh, ring well. What I liked about him, every time, you know, that bell went, he'd get in the centre of the ring and he would work everything with the jab. It would be the jab, the jab, the jab, then bam, uppercut. He was making Famella miss. And, you know, again, then boom, the looping uppercut, you know, his jab looked good. Everything about him, it was educated pressure. It was a mature performance. His stamina looked great. He's got power there. He's a spiteful punch. He's really spiteful. And he can end a fight as well. Now, the German has got an amazing chin and he was in there, he was trying but he couldn't really punch but I think it, I think Conor Ben just took everything away from him in the first round. Now they're talking about Conor Ben potentially fighting Josh Kelly. Now Josh Kelly is a former, you know, Olympian. Did he fight in the Olympics? Please correct me. I think he did and if I'm wrong I do apologise but he's, he's been on a part of the GB team as an amateur. I think he won everything as an amateur, well, most things anyway. And he's come over to the pro game and he looks good. He looks really flashy. You know, he's boxing, he's scintillating. He's kind of a, a fighter's fighter, the way he moves around the ring. He kind of controls the pace of a fight. Now, if you were maybe to say about a year ago, if he was to fight Conor Ben, you would maybe go with Josh Kelly and say that Josh Kelly would beat Conor Ben quite handily. But now after last night, I think Conor Ben beats him. I think Conor Ben stops him. I really do. I think Conor Ben stops Josh Kelly. 
and I think he stops it with sheer power, sheer pressure, and now he's boxing IQ, his jab. But nevertheless, I think it'd be a great fight. Will their styles kind of catch fire? Because Josh Kelly's a kind of counter boxer, he's a counter puncher, he kind of holds off and then catches them when they're coming in. He's got a great jab, great ring IQ. He's got one of the best trainers, I believe, you know, training him and I think managing him as well, Adam Booth. It's a fight that's got to happen, but I do believe what Adam Booth's saying. Let's get Josh Kelly, I think, is fighting for the European title. Let's get that out of the way. Let's get Conor Ben another fight, maybe uh, the British title, because I know he wants to win it, and he potentially wants to win that Lonsdale belt outright. So then they're fighting for the British and European in the summer, because hopefully then we're going to have spectators in, and it will be an absolute stormer of a fight. I, I would love to be at that fight, and hopefully they let audiences in and the crowds back in so can really get behind your fighters. I think the build up for it would be great. They both speak well, they're really eloquent, and that's a fight that a lot of fight fans are gonna get excited for. We know next week, Roy Jones is fighting also as well. We're moving away now from um, the matchroom fighters. Roy Jones is fighting Mike Tyson. That's gonna be an epic encounter, guys. I think that's gonna be a good fight. Whether it's an exhibition and a move around, I think Tyson's gonna go in there to take Roy Jones' head off. I really do. Roy Jones, has he still got that kind of style and reflexes? I'm not so sure, but it will be a great fight. Will I be tuning in to watch it? Yes, I will. I hope they kind of do it with the integrity that it you know, should be seen as. It's an exhibition. So I'm hoping that Tyson doesn't go in there and try to take Roy Jones' head off. And I also hope Roy Jones doesn't go in there and try to take liberties with Tyson with his boxing IQ. But... But it's going to be a good fight, and uh, if anything, for nostalgia, I'm looking forward to tuning in. But there are um, my uh, thoughts of uh, last week's and the weekend's boxings, uh, doings. We know we've got more fights coming up. We've got Joshua fight happening. But it's all exciting times, guys. I can't wait for the boxing ahead. Hopefully, we get more um, crowds back in. We get some gates back in, because that's what boxing needs at the moment. With no audience in, you know, I say audience, but it's crowds. I think it's lacking that kind of cheer excitement so in the coming weeks the coming months i hope the crowds get back in but uh, boxing is definitely in a good place thank you all so much for stopping by amigos and i'll see you all soon cheers guys <laughs>
Let's move on to Chelsea and Newcastle. Chelsea look brilliant, 2-0. Frank Lampard has got Chelsea now playing scintillating football. It was good to see Rudiger come back in the team. It was a nice bit of confidence for him. He played well. You know, their back four seemed well organised without Thiago Silva. Thiago Silva didn't play yesterday, guys, and they still seem well organised. Mendy in goal, he's controlling everything. Good shot stopper. He comes out to claim the ball. He organises the defence. Then you move on to the midfield. Kovacic. I'm a fanboy of Kovacic, guys. As you know, there was a reason he was player of the season last year at Chelsea. He's controlling everything in the midfield. I hope he stays in the team. Ziyech is really settled in. He's just like, it's poetry in motion, as I've mentioned before. When he's on the ball, his vision, the way he releases the ball. Timo Werner really is growing in confidence. Should have had a couple of goals yesterday, but man of the match for me. His vision of play, the way he gets in defenders, the way he's kind of getting his robust attitude about him now. He's getting what the Premier League's all about. Tammy Abraham scoring goals. Chelsea's still got players to come back. Mason Mount, the more confident Lampard kind of gives to Mount, the better he plays. hudson Adoy, the, the whole of Chelsea, their squad, their bench, everything about Chelsea tells me that they will be in the top four. I don't believe they're going to win the league, but they're going to be up there. They're still in the FA Cup. They're in the Champions League. They've had a great start in the Champions League. They look really strong. They've got Rennes next week. I believe they're going to beat Rennes. While this is happening, Thiago Silva is still not in the squad. They've got Pulisic to come back. Thiago Silva, they've just got this wealth of talent at Chelsea. I just can't see them having a bad season. You know how well they played last season. They're going to be better this season. And I believe Chelsea are going to be up there. Man United... I don't think Oli's the right man for them. They were, they were lucky yesterday. And I, and I believe that West Brom could be a bit frustrated with, with that result because West Brom played well yesterday. I, I just don't think Man United look organised. You know, they're scraping through these results. Scraping through. United are one of the best teams in the world. They should be up there. They should be top of the league. Top three. Oli Gunnar Solskjaer is not the right man for United. I think... He's a great guy. I think he's an amazing man, what he achieved as a player at United. Where he got him last season was baffling for me because they didn't look great. They ended up finishing fourth or third. Finished third. Chelsea finished fourth. But I don't think he's the right man for him. And we know who is. We know that Maurizio, if he comes in managing United, he's going to play great football. He had Tottenham playing great football when he was at Southampton. He got them playing this kind of European style of play and you know, Southampton did really well. He we went to Tottenham. You know, we saw what he did at Tottenham. So what will he do if he comes in and manages United? I, I, I believe and I, I think his vision, his style will get Man United where they need to be and that's the top half of the table. He will bring that belief style of play. He's got that charismatic charisma on and off the pitch that he will have players respecting him. Will he get the best out of Pogba? Most probably. You know, United have got a great side. They just need to tick. He's the man to get a tick in. But overall, uh, the Premier League is really exciting. International football, England still look good. I know they've had a couple of bad results, but they look good the other night. Gareth Southgate, is he the man to lead England on to glory? I don't know, but we need to give him a chance. Some people were saying, you know, in five to ten years' time, who will be the next England manager after Gareth Southgate? A lot of people are saying uh, Frank Lampard. But it's exciting, guys. Football in this country, in the UK, is exciting. I can't wait till the crowds get back in and supporting their club. But we need to support all football from the grassroots upwards. But thank you all so much for joining me, amigos. And we'll see you next week for more of my football fun and games. And, um, yeah, it's exciting. Thank you for joining me. Cheers, guys. YouTube, how we doing? Welcome back to my show. My name's Phil. Thank you all so much for tuning in. We're here today to talk about the fight. Oh yes, you guys know. Anthony Joshua against...
Kubra Pulev. Now, guys, I, it's come to my attention a lot lately that a lot of people say I do a lot of David Brentisms. I, I do apologise. I'm a massive Ricky Gervais fan. Funny enough, I got that um, on air sign from Nobby Burton for a tenner. So, uh, what am I doing? Stop this. We're here to talk about boxing. Guys, as I said, thank you so much for joining me. Did you watch the fight last night? What do you think of the fight? I thought the fight was good. I thought Anthony Joshua boxed well. You know, he's not been out in over a year. He come back in against a class operator. Let's not forget, Kubrick only has lost one fight, and that was to Vladimir Klitschko. He's he's a solid fighter. You know, he's he's a former Olympian, so he's no kind of pushover. What do I think about the fight? Do I think there was something missing from Joshua? Do I think Joshua did what he had to do? Absolutely. Should it have been stopped in the third round? Yes, it should have been stopped. He was taking unanswered shots, was Kubrick, and he turned his back. Now, if you turn your back in a fight after you've been taking a lot of shots, the referee should have stopped it. He should have jumped in, should have stopped the fight there and then. Uh, but instead, he gave him a standard count, which I was, um, I was a bit confused by. But then... Kubrick, to his testament, come back and fought well. Was he ever in the fight? No. Did he have that chance of landing a shot on Joshua's chin and stopping him? Absolutely, because it's heavyweight boxing. Did Joshua do what he needed to do? I think so. I think he looked good. Maybe the sixth and maybe seventh round, it was it was some part of me that thought, could Kubrick catch him here? What, what would happen? But he didn't. And then, you know, in the ninth round, Joshua did what he had to do and stopped him. The ref stopped the fight. Right decision. Kubrick's an absolute warrior. It was a great performance from Joshua. You know, it was clear and concise uh, always in his corner. You've got Rob McCracken. Rob McCracken is one of the best trainers in the world, in my opinion. You know, he works uh, on the GB team. He was um, the trainer of Cole Frotch. He's, he knows what he's talking about. And when you listen to him in the corner, He's very clear. He doesn't overcomplicate things. And I think Joshua responds well to Rob McCracken. Great team, in my opinion. Now, some people were saying it was a bit of an odd performance from Joshua. He wasn't quite there at the races. He was a bit gun-shy. I don't think that's the case. But um, I texted my friend last night and I said, do you think that the whole Andy Ruiz first fight still bothers Joshua? And he was like, maybe. And then... I saw Teddy Atlas say he thinks Andy Ruiz still lives in Anthony Joshua's attic. A metaphor, sure. What, what does he mean there? Does that first first fight, which was um, which was a comprehensive beating, wasn't it? Does that still bother Joshua? Even though, yeah, he beat him on the rematch. He beat him well on points, discipline, boxing, display. We know Andy Ruiz didn't really train. He got all that money. You know, he got all that money for the rematch. Was he really up for it? But does that first fight still live in Joshua's head? I th maybe it does. Maybe maybe that's still there. Maybe that still kind of haunts him. Maybe that's why when he's in the fight against Kubrick, he, he, he was a bit hesitant sometimes. Now listen, them telegraph uppercuts that he was landing, like one, two, three, I, you know, he was landing them in bunches. He had great footwork as well yesterday. And he was kind of nullifying um, Kubrick's kind of movement when Kubrick was trying to land a jab. You know, Joshua was getting out of range. His footwork was on point for me. And them uppercuts were great. And that kind of stinging um, left down the, down the pipe, stinging right down the pipe, jabbing with both hands, the uppercut, the foot movement, moving around the ring. His uh, ring generalship looks great. But was there something missing? I don't know. I... I, I <laughs> I definitely, I definitely think he was a bit hesitant at some points, but it's heavyweight boxing, guys. You know, he, he's got his eye on the prize, which is Tyson Fury. Now, I know some of you at home will be going, you know, Phil, make your prediction. I, I, I don't know if I can make a prediction yet, but I, I think it will be an absolute amazing fight. It's got to happen. I think there's a lot of obstacles to get this fight to where it needs to be and get it over the line. You know, Joshua's with Sky. Uh, Eddie Hearn, the zone, um, Furies with BT, SPN, Bob Arum, yes, Frank Warren in the mix. Frank Warren, uh, Eddie Hearn have got this kind of rivalry. Is it going to be a hard fight to make? Absolutely. Are they going to want 50 50? I think Joshua will want more. I think Tyson will want more. And I think that could stall the fight. Do I think they will fight again before they fight each other? Maybe until it gets to the point that 
they have to fight. I don't think they're going to fight with like a thousand people in attendance. This is a big blockbuster, guys. This is a big Wembley arena. This is a fight that, you know, you need thousands of fans for. So I don't think it'll happen to the latter part of next year, which leads me to believe they will have maybe two easy fights just to kind of keep them, keep them moving, keep that ring rust at bay. Uh, but it's a fight that's got to happen. It really has. Tyson is a complete different animal to Kubrick. Complete different animal. You know, for someone who's almost seven feet tall, he has power. He is the best footwork I've seen on a heavyweight in current, you know, current times. Um, and I, it's, it's a chance that he would probably really confuse and nullify Joshua, especially with his jab. Uh, it'd be, I guess, similar to what he did to Wilder. But what, what happens if Joshua starts catching Fury with them uppercuts, telegraphs them right, you know, moves in, in and out of range, keeps that amazing footwork, improves that, and, you know, tries to jab Fury's head off. Now, let's not forget, you know, uh, Joshua's six foot six, almost six foot seven, I think. So it's a fight that has to happen, guys. I think it's a great fight. Yeah. I think the build up for it will be electric. You know, Tyson Fury is, and I'm a fanboy of Tyson Fury, I can't deny it, but he's a complete showman from his talk, from how he boxes. The build up would be brilliant. I think Eddie Earn would love it. Joshua talks well. The styles of kind of confrontation would clash. Uh, they're both really eloquent. They've got good vocabulary. So, yeah, I hope it works. Can you imagine a press conference, guys? Can you imagine Eddie Hearn, Bob Aaron, Frank Warren, Tyson Fury, Anthony Joshua, John John Fury, all in one room giving it to each other? Can you imagine what that would be like? Oh, man, I think that would be as good as the fight. So um, I hope that fight does happen. It's got to happen, isn't it? But was I impressed with Joshua last night? Absolutely. You know, I've always been a fan of Joshua. He does a lot for the local communities. You know, he comes across very well. He's he's a great ambassador for the sport. He really is. Can he beat Fury? Can he beat Fury? I don't know. Can Fury beat Joshua? I don't know, guys. I think it's a tough, tough fight. And it's a fight that has to happen. They're my views on the fight. Now, you're most probably thinking, why have I got a sewing machine in the background there? And uh, in truth, I can't really answer that. But yes, I have a sewing machine in my house. <laughs> a bit random for you. But um, thank you all so much, guys, for like tuning in, watching my stuff. I know a lot of you ask me where I get my apparel from. All my apparel is from Roots of Fight. They're an amazing brand. They're excellent. So if you want to get all your boxing stuff from boxing to wrestling uh, to baseball, they do the lot. Roots of Fight, I'll put all their um, information in the link below. So do, do check them out. I'm going to be coming uh, back in the coming days, guys. We're going to be talking more uh, things sport, all things sport, football. We've got loads planned. I've been really busy because obviously I have um, a job as well and I have to kind of get filming around, you know, working and sometimes it can be quite difficult but um thank you all so much guys for the support that this channel's getting i really do appreciate it and you know i'm just this tall lanky gangly london lad who just talks about sport and you guys seem to support me so thank you all so much i'm going to be coming back in a few days time or maybe next week talking about football and more things boxing and maybe a bit of mma my name's phil guys thank you all so much for tuning in cheers amigos